passage in uh, Matthew chapter 2, if you have your Bibles. One of my favourite TV shows to watch when I was growing up was A Question of Sport. Um, I'm sure that many of you have probably seen it. And um, on Question of Sport, there are different rounds that go through on the show, different um, styles of questions. And my favourite round to watch was always a round called What Happens Next? What Happens Next? And they show a clip um, from a sporting event, and then it stops, and the teams have to try and work out what happens next. And usually something completely unexpected happens. Now, in thinking about what to share with us the day after Christmas Day, um, I thought it made sense to share what happens next after the nativity scene that we're all um, so familiar with. What happens next? And that is um, what we've heard from our passage in Matthew chapter 2, isn't it? What happens next? And especially it's what happens next with um, the wise men and with King Herod. We see, don't we, in verses um, 9 to 12 that Herod has told, um, told the wise men to go and search for the child. And they do that and they find the child. Verse 10, they saw the star. They were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then what happens? Well, they're warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, and they return to their country by another route. They've been warned, and so they decide to go back to their country by another route. And then what happens next? Well, there's another dream. This time, Joseph has a dream. Verse 13. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. And what we see happening here in the immediate aftermath of the birth of Jesus is a sort of reversal to something else that's happened in the Bible. I wonder if some of you have played um, the game Mario Kart. And on this game Mario Kart, once you get through all of the different levels, there comes a point where you can play all of the tracks, you can race around the different tracks in mirror mode, where the tracks are completely back to front to what you'd expect. And so you're driving down and you're expecting the track to go around to the right, and it actually goes around to the left. And it's really completely confusing. And what happens here in this passage is a complete reversal to something else that has happened in the Bible. All the way back in Exodus, um, near the start of the Bible, there's another king who does just what Herod has done, where he starts to kill all the baby boys of Israel. And why does he do it there? Well, it's because they're growing in size and in power, and he wants to protect himself. He wants to protect his throne and his power. And that's exactly what King Herod does here. King Herod is concerned when he finds out that another um, boy has been born, another king has been born. And so he wants to protect the little power that he has and seeks to find Jesus to kill him. Herod was supposed to be the king over Israel. It was supposed to be his job to protect the people and advance their interests. But instead, he kills to try and protect his own interests. And the baby Jesus and his parents are forced to flee into Egypt to survive. Of course, it was in Egypt... It was the king of Egypt, the pharaoh, that was killing the baby boys of Israel before. And yet now we see the true king of Israel fleeing into Egypt to be saved there. Here, Egypt is now part of the Roman Empire and so um, is a relatively safe place for um, Jesus and his family to go. But generally in the Bible, Egypt is a place which is synonymous with captivity and slavery. But here, Egypt is a place which brings salvation for Jesus and his family. They're saved from King Herod as they go there. It's completely back to front what happened to um, before in the Bible. But what can we learn from this? What can we learn from this reversal that takes place here? Well, it brings us, I think, a warning on the one hand, and then it brings us hope on the other hand. 
I'm sure many of us have seen recently, haven't we, the warnings that are everywhere. There are adverts in the paper, messages on TV. And what are they telling us? Well, they're telling us that we need to be careful, again, about COVID. We need to wear our masks and keep distanced. It doesn't matter how many jabs you've had, COVID can still get you. You're not out of the reach of COVID yet. We need to be careful. And the lesson here in our passage is that no one is beyond the reach of sin. No one is beyond the reach of sin. It was the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, um, all that time ago that was seeking to kill the babies, and now it's the king of Israel that's doing it. Um, Even the king of Israel is now turning to murder to try and protect himself. Now, I'm sure most of us this morning aren't going to be thinking about murdering anyone anytime soon. But we've got to consider our own hearts and consider the hearts of Herod. And where was his heart at the time that he was doing this? You see, Herod's problem was that he was putting himself first. He was putting his own interests first. He had got to this position of power, hadn't he, where he was um, a designated king over a small area in the Middle East, but really he was under the thumb of the Roman Empire. And what he's doing is he's trying to conserve what little power he has. He's out to protect himself and what he's got. And now let's consider our own hearts this morning. Are we putting ourselves first in our lives? As we go through life, are we seeking to look after our own interests and put ourselves first in everything? Or are we paying attention to the people around us and more importantly to God and the way that he's given for us to live? So often the world around us teaches us this message, doesn't it? It tells us to put ourselves first because no one else will. The world tells us, put yourself first. No one else is going to do that. But the Bible tells us that if God is not king in our lives, if God is not first in our lives, if we're not looking to him as our creator, sustainer, and redeemer, then we're in trouble. We're tyrants of a sort if we're the king of our own lives and we're doing what we think is best and we're not trusting God and his way for the world. We need to consider our own hearts and put our trust in God, in Jesus, this morning. That is why Jesus came, so that we could trust in him, so that he could be the king of our lives, so that he could show us the way that he would have us to live, so that we can live in relative peace and in right relationship with God. So this is the warning for us. Even the king of God's chosen people could turn away into great wickedness. And all of us, no matter who we are or how good we think we might be this morning, are not out of the reach of sin and its effects. We might be um, the nicest person in Bridge End, but if God is not king in our lives, then we are in trouble. But this passage brings us a hope as well, doesn't it? And the whole Christmas story really brings us hope. And what is that hope? Well, it's that no place and no people are too far away to be saved. No place, no people are too far away to be saved. Jesus comes, doesn't he? He comes into um, Judea as a Jew to, to historically God's chosen people. And yet his own people try and kill him. And one day they would succeed, wouldn't they? But to all who will receive him, there is salvation. I think the great key to understanding the Christmas stories is looking to understand who are the ones who receive Jesus. As we read the different Christmas stories, the different accounts of the wise men and the shepherds, what we should be looking for is who it is that Jesus comes for and who it is that receives him. Well, we see, don't we, as we do that, that Jesus comes for everyone. Jesus is there. The angels tell um, the shepherds that Jesus is for everyone. He'll be good news of great joy for all people. But what's the key? Well, the key is that some people don't receive him and some people do. Think of the people we've read about in the story, don't we? King Herod's supposed to be the king of Israel, but he doesn't know where the Messiah is going to be born. He doesn't know where Jesus is going to be born. So he calls the um, religious leaders and the chief priests. And these religious guys, they know exactly where Jesus is going to be born, where the Messiah is going to be born. But are they interested in going to find him and going to worship him? No, they couldn't care less. They're not interested in going to find him. But who else do we have in this story? Well, we have the Magi coming from far away. And what are they doing? Well, they're coming to look for answers, to find the king that has been born. The chief priests, they know exactly where Jesus has been born, but they don't care. The wise men don't know. They come looking for answers, 
and they find him. They find the king who has come to all people. So we need to ask ourselves this Christmas, have we received Jesus? As um, Uncle Trev so um, brilliantly reminded us this morning, encouraged us this morning, have we received Jesus, the gift given to all people, the gift that we all need, the gift that we can all enjoy? He came for all people and we all need to receive him. We need to not be like the chief priests. We need to be like the wise men, like the shepherds who did receive this king. The one who came for sinners, tax collectors, religious leaders, the self-loathing and the self-righteous. But the one who is only of use to those who will receive him. And we see that Jesus came, didn't he? He didn't come to Jerusalem. No, he didn't go to Rome. He didn't go to a palace. No, he came to Bethlehem, this small place on the outskirts of Jerusalem. And he went from there to Egypt, across to Africa. And he went from there to Nazareth, another small place out of the way. And one day he would make it to Jerusalem, wouldn't he? And he would be crowned there, but it would be crowned with a crown of thorns as he was lifted up on the cross to die in the place of sinners, as one who was despised and rejected. Why? That all who trust in him might receive life and salvation because Jesus had come to die hadn't he he'd come to die that he might bring us life but we see in this passage that his time to die had not yet come he had a ministry to fulfill and so God uses his parents Mary and Joseph and their faithfulness to God to save him we learn here don't we that obedience to God can be the means for salvation Mary and Joseph, just an ordinary couple who had an extraordinary thing happen to them. And why did it happen? How did it happen? Well, it just happened as they trusted God. God could have used extraordinary means to protect Jesus, couldn't he? He could have had legions of angels flying around him the whole time that he walked the earth. But no, he used the faithful obedience and tender care of Mary and Joseph to protect Jesus and to raise him up as he grew into the man that he would become. The God of all the universe, the God of all power, uses the simple faith of an average couple to bring his son into the world. I don't know about you, but if you can remember back to 2020 and when COVID, sorry to keep mentioning this, but when COVID first became a thing, there was a time, wasn't there, fairly early on where maybe we were out on our walks and we could hear all the birds singing extra loud there were less cars on the road and we thought to ourselves oh i hope things don't go back to how they were before this is really nice isn't it and then a few months went by and we were all just desperate to get back to some kind of normality we just couldn't wait for the glorious return of the ordinary and normal things and the good news of this passage for us is that god uses gloriously ordinary people to accomplish his purposes on earth. And that has huge implications for us. I'm going to assume that most of us here this morning are fairly ordinary people. And even if we're not, even if we're ultra rich, God can still use us for his purposes. God can use us to be the means of salvation, of comfort, and of encouragement to the people around us. So as we look ahead to um, a coming new year, why not let's commit this coming year to um, trying to make use of our ordinary lives to, um, to, to have God's extraordinary purposes work out through us. We're told, aren't we, in Hebrews chapter 13 that some people have even given hospitality to angels and not realized it. And I wonder if the Egyptians, I'm sure that there are Egyptian families that received Mary and Joseph and Jesus into their homes as they fled. I wonder if they knew who Jesus was truly was who knows that's not something that we can know but one thing that this passage does do is tell us exactly who Jesus was this passage tells us exactly who Jesus was and tells us exactly what Jesus came to do as well look with me at verse 15 verse 15 of Matthew chapter 2 tells us exactly who Jesus was and exactly what he had come to do Um, where he stayed until the death of Herod, and so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. 
out of Egypt I called my son. So this is who Jesus is, and this is what he had come to do. Well, we're not told exactly what he had come to do here in that passage, are we? But if we look to the context of um, the prophet that is being quoted there in Matthew chapter 2, then we're told a great deal about who Jesus was and what he had come to do. This passage quotes from um, Hosea chapter 11. And Hosea there is looking back again to the Exodus. Israel was in captivity in Egypt and um, God calls Israel, the nation of Israel, his firstborn son and then rescues them from Egypt. God calls them out of Egypt. And we're told here in the same way, Jesus, God's true son, is called out of Egypt. We're told here that Jesus is going to be the fulfillment of the nation of Israel. If you remember back to the Exodus, why were the nation of Israel called out of Egypt? Well, it was so that they could worship God, so that they could be the true children of God, so they'd have freedom to have that relationship with God. And what happened after they were called out? Well, they disobeyed God. They continually turned from him for years and years and years. They constantly, in many different ways, rejected God and turned from him. And that reminds us of another son of God, doesn't it? In, um, in Luke's gospel, we're told that Adam was the first son of God. Adam, the first man, likewise, was created in that perfect garden to know and enjoy sonship, relationship with God. And yet what happened? He turned his back on God. He rejected God and went his own way. And so here in this passage, as we're told that Jesus was called out of Egypt and that Jesus is God's true son, what do we learn? Well, we learn that Jesus is God's true son and he was going to succeed where everyone previously had failed. Jesus had come to succeed, to bring true sonship, to bring um, adoption to all people who will trust in Jesus. All people who trust in Jesus become the children of God because of what the true Son of God, Jesus, has done. Jesus is the true and faithful Son of God. All who trust in Jesus are united to him. Jesus' faithful life where he never sinned, his death on the cross where he paid the price for sin, his new resurrection life as he rose from the dead, all belong to the people of God who trust in him. And that gives us great hope, doesn't it? We're told in Hosea chapter 11, just a few verses later, that God is never going to f- um, forget about his people. He's never going to reject his people. Why? Because they belong to the true son. The true son who has been obedient in their place. The true son who has paid the price for sin in their place. The true son who has risen to new life, to provide life, to give life to all who trust in him. Because of the life and death and resurrection of the true son all who believe in Jesus become true sons and daughters of God and even in our own unfaithfulness even when we do turn away from God if we're Christians we belong to Jesus we're united to him our salvation is certain if we belong to Christ why again because we belong to him and we are resting in his life and death and resurrection for us. We belong to the true son, and so God will never cast us out because of his life and death. We see in this passage, don't we, that while, while the kings of the earth, while people like Herod would use death as a weapon to try and hold on to their power, in Jesus, God stooped and suffered and suffered death so that we might receive life to save um, all who will trust in him to save both the victims and even the victimizers. The wonderful truth of the gospel is that if Herod had come to trust in Jesus, he too would have been saved. Think about um, Stephen and Paul. Don't you think it's amazing that because of the grace of God in heaven right now are Stephen and Paul together? Stephen, who was the first martyr killed for his faith. Paul, who stood there and oversaw it happening and was a persecutor and killer of Christians. And yet he too came to know the grace of God and was saved. Both victims and former victimizers can be saved 
because of what Jesus has done, because of his grace. And we have to consider, don't we, the innocent victims in this passage. It's a hard passage to read. Look at verses 16 to 18, the great evil that Herod committed. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. What we see here is that where God is at work, we can expect great opposition from Satan and from the world. The same is true of us. Where God's at work in our lives and the people around us, we can expect opposition from Satan and from the world. What else do we see in this passage? We see that God knows and that he's sovereign and that where God is at work, his purposes will be accomplished. But why the death of these innocent children? Well, I don't know if we can fully answer that in this life. Uh, The great Puritan Matthew Henry calls the death of these innocent children a martyrdom because they died for Christ. And I'm inclined to agree with him, to be honest. We can't understand, can we, why this was um, fully allowed to happen. But what we can do is cling to the justice of God. We know that God is good. We know that he is holy. We know that he is just. At times we might struggle, mightn't we, with the holiness and perfect justice of God. But here, I think it's essential. I actually don't think I could preach on this passage if I didn't believe in hell, if I didn't believe that God would one day punish um, people for committing great evils like this. The truth is that Jesus will one day return to judge those who tried to kill him when he was just an infant. Uh, The Heidelberg Catechism has a question that is phrased like this. What comfort is it to you that Christ will come to judge the living and the dead? Have you ever thought about it like that? What comfort is it to you that Christ will return to judge the living and the dead? And it answers like this. In all my sorrow and persecution, I lift up my head and eagerly await as judge from heaven the very same person who before has submitted himself to the judgment of God for my sake and has removed all the curse from me. He will cast all his and my enemies into everlasting condemnation, but he will take me and all his chosen ones to himself in heavenly joy and glory. For those who have been hurt, for those who have been abused, this is a wonderful truth. This is a wonderful comfort. For all of us, this should be a wonderful truth and comfort that one day Jesus will return and sin will be completely dealt with. If we're trusting Christ, we have no condemnation or punishment to fear. Jesus took all of that on the cross. We have only that heavenly joy and glory to look forward to. And how does this happen? Well, it's because Jesus didn't stay in the manger. He didn't stay in Egypt, did he? We have to make sure that this Christmas time we don't leave Jesus in the nativity scene. In a matter of months, the joy of the angels and shepherds and the worship of the wise men would turn to a weeping and a mourning, wouldn't it? Years later, there would be more weeping and mourning just a few miles away. Simeon's prophecy to Mary that a sword would pierce her soul would come true as Jesus was crucified, as he died that savage death. But Jesus wasn't dying without reason. He was paying the price for sin. He was saving both victims and former victimizers. He was saving all who will trust in him, bringing the hope of heaven and glory. Jesus, the true son of God, made himself a servant by taking on humanity to suffer and to die, to bring us to our heavenly home above. As one modern carol puts it, Our God made low to raise us up. Emmanuel has come to us. He comes to us at Christmas. He comes to us as we trust in him to cover our disobedience, to pay the price for our sins, to bring us true life, true meaning, true acceptance, true freedom, true humanity even. As we trust in Jesus, we become the people that we were made to be, people who can enjoy relationship with God, who have no condemnation or punishment to fear, but have a relationship with God forever to look forward to. And so, as we close, the challenge for us this morning is, are we going to 
leave ourselves as the king of our own lives? Leave ourselves to try and make a way through life? Or are we going to trust Jesus? Are we going to repent and turn from our sins and trust in Jesus, the one who loved us and gave himself for us? We need to do that. Why do we need to do that? Well, because the Magnificat, that song of Mary that we started our time of worship together with, will one day be fulfilled as Jesus returns. The proud will be humbled and the humble will be raised up. And we need to ask ourselves this morning, are we proud? Are we trusting in ourselves? Are we rejecting God? Or are we trusting in him? Have we humbled ourselves by turning from our sin and trusting in Christ? Let's remember, as our passage has taught us, no one is beyond sin, but also no one is beyond saving because of the faithful son that loved us and gave himself for us. Let's pray together.